Who was Steve Jobs? Who was Steve Jobs? Who was Steve Jobs? Steve Jobs always loved machines. His father repaired machines for a living. As a child, Steve loved to watch his dad build and fix things. When Steve grew up, he started a company that built machines. Not just any machines, but a machine Steve was sure would soon become part of daily life, just like cars and TV sets. What was this machine? A personal computer. Today, millions of people own personal computers. Back, back, back in the 1970s, nobody did. The first modern computer came out in 1938. A computer built in 1946 was as big as a room. When Steve was a kid, computers were still too big and complicated for the average person to use. The government used them to gather information. Steve was going to change that. Steve and his friend Steve Wozniak started Apple computers in the Jobs' garage. Their computer, the Apple II, was the hit of a West Coast computer fair in 1977. Why? It looked fun to use. In 1979, Steve visited uh, the research center of the tech, co tech company Xerox. It was in Palo Alto, California. He walked around, looking at the new computers that the engineers were working on. What's that? Steve asked one man. He pointed to a small gadget by a computer. When the engineer moved the gadget with his hand, an arrow on the computer screen moved too. This is a point-and-click graphic user interface, the man explained. That sure was a complicated name for a gadget that did something very simple and very amazing. Every time the man moved the pointer to a picture on the screen and clicked, it opened a program. On the computer, Steve stared at the little gadget. In 1979, computers were operated by punching in keys on a keyboard. To work the computer, you had to know the right keys to push. This little gadget made using the computer so much easier. Steve couldn't believe it. He imagined having something similar for his computers. When are you going to sell it? He asked the engineer. We are not, he said. It's fun, but there's, there's no market for it. Steve Jobs knew differently. As he stared at the little gadget, he could see the future rolling out in front of him. Billions of people pointing and clicking on their home computers. He would have to improve the gadget. He would make it better, and he wouldn't call it a point-and-click graphical user interface. He would call it by its friendlier nickname, the mouse. That day, Steve knew the world was going to change, and he, Steve Jobs, was going to make it happen. Chapter 1 Growing Up in the Valley In 1954, Joanna Sivo was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin. She fell in love with a teaching assistant. He was from Syria, and his name was Abdul Fatah Jandali. They were young and had no money. So when Joanne learned she was going to have a baby, they decided to put the baby up for adoption. Paul and Claire Jobs wanted a child very much. They adopted the couple's baby and named him Steve Paul Jobs. He was born on February 24, 1955. 
Three years after Steve was born, the Jobses adopted the little girl, Patty. Steve liked his little sister, but they didn't have much in common. The family lived in Mountain View, California. It was a beautiful area full of fruit trees. People called it the Valley of Hearts Delight, but Mountain View was changing. New companies were coming to the area. The companies were trying to develop new electronic equipment. Eventually, the area became known by a different name, Silicon Valley. Steve loved to help his father work on cars. Paul even made him his own little workbench when Steve was five. He showed him how to use a hammer and a saw. Paul was a mechanical wiz, and he passed on his love of gadgets to his son. A neighbor gave Steve his first ha her her heart health kit. Steve made radio trans trans transistors with it. In 1968, when he was 13, Steve discovered a, par a part was missing from one of his kits. The kit was made by Hewlett Packard, a big company in Silicon Valley that developed and made parts, of parts for computers. Steve got a phone book and looked up the number of Bill Hewitt. He was one of the founders of the company. Steve called him to complain. By the time they got off the phone, Hewitt had offered Steve a summer job and promised him a bag full of machine parts. What was Steve's answer? Yes, of course. Steve also joined the Hewitt Packers, Packers Explorer Club. It offered lectures to kids interested in electronics. At one lecture, Steve saw a computer for the first time. At school, Steve hung around with other kids who loved electronics. He also had a girlfriend, Chris. Chrisam Brennan. Through the kids in his computer club, Steve met Steve Woz Wozniak, who was several years older. Woz had an amazing talent for making things. He was going to a local college and designing computers as a hobby. When Steve graduated from high school in 1972, he enrolled at Reed College in Oregon. There was only one problem. Steve couldn't pay for college. So Steve went to the Dean of Reed. He asked if he could live in the dorms and sit in on classes for free. Steve wouldn't ever get the degree, but he would learn about subjects he was interested in. Why would the Dean agree to that? like Bill Hewitt at Hewitt Packard. The dean was impressed by Steve, and he did say yes. Within a week, Steve was attending classes. He studied Eastern religions and calligraphy, which was the art of fine handwriting. It wasn't an easy life. Steve slept on the floor of his friend's rooms. He collected coke butters for spending money, and he depended on local charities for food. Steve stayed at Reed for 18 months. He'd had enough of college life. He wanted to go to India to get money for the trip. He took a job at Atari. It made some of the very first computer games. His friend Woz was already working there. By summer, Steve had saved enough to go to India. After the trip, he came back to Atari. Personal computers in 1976, if you saw them at all, looked like 
airplane cockpits full of switches and lights. Was had created a circuit board for an easy to use personal computer. A person could type in a command. Was explained to Steve, and the computer would follow the command on a TV screen in front of the person. Was thought of it as a neat project. Steve thought it could be more than that. He thought they should leave Atari. And start a whole new campaign. Chapter two: The Birth of Apple. Apple computers officially went into business on April Fool's Day, 1976. Steve was living with his girlfriend, Kristen Brennan, who was an artist. The new company's office was Steve's parents' garage. All the work was done there. They planned to sell Woz's circuit boards to people who wanted to build their own home computers. They built a simple sample computer with Woz's circuit board to show how it worked. They called the computer the Apple. Why did they pick the name? Well, Steve ate a lot of fruit sometimes, nothing but fruit. He thought the Apple was. The best fruit of all. It was perfect, just like he wanted his computer to be. They showed the computer with Woz's circuit board to the owner of a local electronics store. He said, "I can't see stacking just circuit boards. Not that many people know how to put together a whole computer. But if you could sell me computers like this one, I think people would buy them." The store owner offered Steve twenty-five thousand dollars for fifty Apple computers. He'd pay in cash when he had the machines. "Did," said Steve. "Even though making so many computers would cost a lot of money, money they didn't have." But Steve came up with an idea. He went to an electronic supply store. He persuaded the store to give him. The parts to make the computers. Steve couldn't pay for the parts right then, but he promised to pay the store back later. Steve was awfully good at persuading people to do what he asked. The store said yes. Each Apple computer cost two hundred twenty dollars to make. Each Apple computer was sold to the electronics store for five hundred dollars. So even after Steve and Woz paid back the electronic supply store, they made a very big profit. If most people today saw that Apple computer, they would be stunned. It didn't come with a keyboard, monitor, or case. Steve and Woz knew they could do better. What if they made a computer that came with everything, so a person could just take it out of the box? And use it right away. Steve bet they could sell a lot. He and Woz got to work on making such a computer, the Apple II. Woz and Steve had big dreams for the Apple II. Woz wanted it to have color, sound, and shape. Crisp graphics. Steve wanted it to accept floppy disks that could store extra information. He wanted to encase. The computer in modeled plastic. At the time, plastic was much more expensive than metal or wood. But Steve thought plastic looked cool and modern. And how a computer looked was important. If it looked good, people would want it. Steve found an investor who gave them enough money to finish the Apple II in time for a computer fair in San Francisco. They took models to display at the fair. There was a lot that was new and different about the Apple II. While Woz was working on the computer, Steve hired a designer to come up with a new logo. A logo is a picture that stands for a company. A good logo helps people remember the company. For instance, General Electric's logo is a light bulb. Steve wanted an apple. To represent Apple, 
I press up, I press up, the logo looked fine. It was rainbow colored and had a bite taken out of it. Wasn't Steve's hard work paid off? People visiting the West Coast Computer Fair in 1977 passed many displays of bulky computers that looked like high school science projects. Then they saw the Apple II. Here was a computer that featured color, clear graphics, and the sound. For years afterward, every other computer company would copy it. All the technological improvements were the work of Steve Wozniak. But Steve Jobs' design ideas were just as important. He had learned from his dad to insist on perfection. Even wires inside the computer, wires that nobody could see, had to be perfectly straight. This was the way Steve's dad built machines, and Steve would do everything had to look simple and beautiful. By 1978, Chapter 3, Up and Down and Out. By 1978, Apple was making money. The company grew quickly. Steve wanted all Apple products to run smoothly, but working with Steve was not easy. Small mistakes made him angry. Sometimes Steve yelled at his employees, even making them cry. And if he didn't get what he wanted, he often burst into tears himself. Employees tried to please Steve, but often Steve couldn't explain what he wanted. He simply said, I'd know it when I see it. In 1979, Apple started to make a new home computer that used the mouse. The company hired thousands of employees. Steve worked long hours and he expected his employees to work hard too. He was so devoted to Apple that he didn't have time for anything else. His girlfriend, Charizan, Chari had a daughter, Lisa, on May 17, 1978. Steve refused to have anything to do with his baby. He had no interest in a family. In 1980, Steve Jobs became the youngest person in history to make Fortune magazine's list of top Americans in business. He was 25 years old, and he was a millionaire. Then in 1981, something terrible happened. Was his private plane crashed? It took months for Woz to recuperate. He never returned to work for Apple for a time. <coughs> it was a big change for Steve. He and Woz had worked together so closely. Working with other engineers wasn't nearly as satisfying. Steve wasn't happy with the company's next computer. It was too big and too expensive. Nobody wanted to pay $10,000 for a computer. Steve had already set his sights on a new idea. It was a computer called the Macintosh. A Macintosh is a type of Apple. The Macintosh would change the world. Steve was sure of it. He hand-picked a team of engineers to build it. They worked in a separate building a pilot flag flew on it, on top. It's better to be a pilot than to join the Navy, he said. By this, he meant sometimes it was good to break rules and think in a different way. Steve broke all sorts of rules. He didn't like to wear shoes. He only ate fruit. He thought his diet made him so clean that he didn't need to bathe often. A lot of people didn't like to walk with him because he smelled bad. Despite his strange ways, Steve could convince people to do things that seemed impossible. An upper employee made up a name for Steve's power. He called it the Reality Distortion Field, RDF. Steve's RDF made people believe that anything Steve wanted was possible 
if they worked hard enough. One thing Steve really wanted was to hire a smart businessman at Apple. He thought the best person was John Scully. Scully was the head of the Pepsi Cola company. He wasn't sure if he should go to Apple. So Steve asked him, Do you want to sell sugared water for the rest of your life, or do you want to come with me and change the world? Here was Steve's RDF at work. Like many, bef like many before him, Scully ended up do doing what Steve wanted. He came to work for Apple. In 1984, Steve introduced the Macintosh to the world. It was a computer for the rest of us, according to the ads. That meant it was not just for scientists and super brainy tech nerds, it was easy to use and friendly to look at. It incorporated everything Steve had learned about slick design. It even used the knowledge of calligraphy he'd learned about back at Reed. When people typed on their Mac computers, Steve wanted the letters to be beautiful. He spent a lot of time choosing how much space would be in between letters. The Mac offered several different fonts or writing styles. Each one had slightly different letters. This made typing on the Mac fun. The Macintosh was far from perfect. It didn't have very much memory, and there was no way of adding on more. One man at Apple called it a Honda with a one-gallon gas tank. But in Steve's words, the Macintosh computer was insanely great. The first Macintosh commercial run during the Super Bowl in 1984. By the end of the game, everyone wanted to know more about the Mac. The Mac sold amazingly well for a short time. Why wasn't it a giant hit? People were just not as interested in buying home computers as Steve had expected. And not all customers who did want a home computer bought Apple computers. Many bought computers from IBM or Macintosh Ma or Microsoft. John Scully was not happy at Apple. For him, the disappointing Macintosh sales were proof that Steve's ideas were wrong. Regular people would never need or want home computers. If Apple was to survive, Scully said it should make computers for businesses. They should make Apple computers that worked with products made by other computer companies. Steve hated the idea. He wanted customers to run Apple products on Apple computers. He didn't want outside programmers anywhere near the Macintosh. Steve didn't like someone else telling him what to do. He had hired Scully hoping that the older man would teach him how to run a big company. After that, Steve expected Sally to hand the reins back to him. Instead, Scully wanted to make more changes. Every big company has a group of outside people that give advice to the company. This kind of group is called a board. A company's board can also hire and fire the head of the company. Steve tried to get Apple's board to fire Scully. That didn't happen. Instead, the board replaced Steve as head of the Macintosh. It was May 1985. Steve Jobs lost all the power he had at Apple. He was moved to a new office across the street from most of the other Apple buildings. He rarely saw other employees. Steve nicknamed his new office. Siberia, which is a remote part of Russia, it made him so unhappy. He started spending less time at work. In September, September of that year, Steve left Apple. What would Steve Jobs do next? Chapter 4. What's next? By 1985, families were starting to buy computers for their homes. College students regularly working, worked on computers to do schoolwork. 
Steve Jobs wasn't finished with the computer business. He wanted to show the people at Apple that they were wrong about him. He started a new company. He called it Next because it was going to be the next step in computers. He hoped to sell his new computers to colleges across the country. Students and professors would work with them, but Steve's plan for the perfect computer was expensive. He hired a famous designer to create a logo for his new company. This logo cost $100,000. Next lost $10 million in three years. Steve put more and more of his own money into the company, but nobody was buying the computers he made. They were too expensive. Colleges couldn't afford computers that cost $6,500 apiece. Nothing at the next was going the way Steve hoped, but he struggled on. He tried to run the company in a different way from Apple. He called the employees members of the next community. He paid people according to how long they had worked at Next. He gave frequent raises. He, Steve, could be generous, but he was still the same demanding boss he had always been. Steve's family life was changing. In 1986, his mother died. Although Steve considered the Jobses to be his real parents, he was interested to know about the couple who gave birth to him. A doctor's name was on Steve's birth certificate. Through that doctor, he learned that his mother's maiden name was Joanna Shebo. She had married his father Abdul Fatah Jandal in 1956 and had a daughter Mona. They weren't married for long. Joanna then married a man whose last name was Simpson. Her daughter went by the name Mona Simpson. Steve met his mother and a new sister. Mona was a novelist. Even though Steve and Mona hadn't grown up together, they became close. Mona also encouraged Steve to be a part of his daughter Lisa's life. Lisa was seven now. Steve had had many girlfriends since Chris Sam Burnham. One was the famous folk singer John Beats. Dating John Beats was especially exciting for Steve because she had once been the girlfriend of one of his favorite singers, Bob Dylan. But Steve was in his mid-thirties and had never come close to being married. Then, in 1990, Steve gave a lecture at Stanford University. In the audience was Lori Powell. Lauren was a graduate student studying business. Lauren was so pretty that Steve noticed her right away. Afterward, the two got to talking like Steve, Lauren, didn't eat meat and was very smart. They exchanged the phone numbers. Steve went out into the parking lot to find his car. He had a business meeting that night. But as he was getting into his car, he thought to himself, if this was my last day on earth, would I rather spend it at a business meeting or with this woman? He ran across the parking lot and caught up with Lauren. The two had dinner together. A year later, they were married in Yosemite National Park. Steve and Lauren's first child, Reed Paul Jobs, was born in September 1991. He was named after Reed College. Things still weren't going well at the next, but Steve was discovering that life was more than just business. His father, the person he was closest to, died. 
In 1993, Steve had loved the time he spent working on cars with his father. He wanted his children to have happy memories of him, too. His now teenage daughter Lisa came to live with him for the first time. Even if he was never a success again, Steve thought he would have a happy family life. Chapter 5 To Infinity and Beyond Steve Jobs admired anyone who did something new and different. He was a huge fan of George Lucas, the director of the Star Wars movies. In 1980, Steve bought a, a theater for a night so that everyone at Apple could see The Empire Strikes Back together. In 1986, Steve finally got to work with Lucas. He became an owner in Lucas's computer graphics compute companies. Steve named the company Pixar. Lucas's company had created a new kind of animation using a computer. Steve hoped to sell this program to animators, but it was too expensive. Artists didn't think they needed it. Pixar was losing a lot of money. In fact, Steve put more than $50 million of his own money to keep the company going. He only paid himself $50 a year for his salary. In 1991, Steve laid off most of Pixar's staff. One person he didn't lay off was John Lasseter. Lasseter had made a number of short computer animated films. The films were the best way to show customers what the program could do. Lasseter's short movies were good. One of them, Tin Toy, won an Oscar for Best Animated Short Film in 1981. 89. Despite the Oscar, Pixar was a failure, a big failure. Next, and Pixar was seen as proof that Steve was nothing more than a slink salesman. Even his early success with Apple II was considered a fluke. Was, was a genius, people thought, not Steve. In 1999, in 1991, the Walt Disney Company wanted to hire Lasseter. But he said no. And once again, Steve came up with one of his unusual offers. He convinced Disney to give Pixar enough money to make three full length animated movies. All the animation would be done on a computer. This had never been done before. Perhaps Disney fell under the influence of Steve's famous reality distortion field. By this time, all the people at Pixar knew about the power of Steve's RDF. They even had a signal for it. In meetings, when someone was getting, getting sucked into the RDF, people would tap on their ears. The deal with Disney wouldn't make Pixar much money. If the movies were hits, Disney would get most of the profits. But it gave Steve a chance to get Pixar movies made. Animated movies take a long time to make. Pixar started work on its first full length movie in 1991, but it did not come out for another four years. Meanwhile, Steve kept pouring funds into both Pixar and the next. In 1993, Steve had to lay off most of the workers at the next. He felt so helpless and so awful that he stopped going into work. He spent his days at home with Reed. He loved being with his little boy, who he said had Rowan's kindness. Chapter 6 Return to Napole. Steve didn't know it, but he was about to be rescued by a cowboy and a spaceman. Inspired by Tin Toy, Pixar's first full length movie opened in 1995. It was called Toy Story. The characters were old toys a cowboy doll and an astronaut. Action figures were the stars. 
Toy Story became the most popular movie of the year. Pixar went on to make a dozen hit movies in a row. By 1996, after 10 years of struggle, Steve Jobs was a success, a big success. He wasn't a millionaire anymore, he was a billionaire. Apple, however, the company he had co-founded, was struggling. Apple computers had failed to change with the times. Other computers were just as good and less expensive. Apple computers were slow. They couldn't handle new features that had been developed for computers over the decade. John Scully, who had forced Steve out, had been himself forced out in 1993. Now, the board at Apple wanted Steve back. For Steve, having the power to do things the way he wanted was more important than having a huge amount of money. He wasn't that interested in buying expensive things. The house where he lived with his family didn't look like the house of a billionaire. Steve had mixed feelings about returning to Apple. He had bad memories of the way he'd been treated at Apple. He was already the head of a very successful company at Pixar. He and Lorraine had a daughter, Erin Sienna, born in 1995. Did he really want to take on a struggling company? If it had been any other company, the answer might have been no. But Apple was his baby. He couldn't just sit by and watch it die. Steve agreed to act as the head of Apple, but only for a while. Apple had to look for someone else to become his permanent replacement. He gave himself a salary of one dollar per year. Right away, Steve made big changes. In Boston in 1997, he announced to an audience full of Mac lovers that Apple was going to team up with Mac Microsoft. Apple and Microsoft were going to work together. This was unheard of, but Steve said that all Apple computers would use Microsoft's Internet Explorer web browser. Behind Steve on stage was a giant TV screen. When Bill Gates, the head of Microsoft, appeared on the screen, the audience booed. But Steve knew that. The $150 million deal would help Apple. He was right. The company's value rose. Steve made other changes. He got rid of products that weren't selling. He cut costs. He laid off so many workers that Apple, Apple employees were afraid of riding an elevator with him. They were scared that they would no longer have to have a job by the time they got to their floor. Steve still claimed that he was only a temporary CEO. In 1997, he told Time magazine, I'm here almost every day, but just for the next few months, I'm really clear on that. But he was making changes for the future. Chapter 7. Think Different In 1997, in cities across America, a series of posters appeared on buildings, buses, and billboards. The posters showed photos of famous people known for doing something new. There was a poster of Alfred Hitchcock, the famous movie director. Another poster was of Lucy, Lucille Ball and the Desi are Nazi stars of I Love Lucy. Another poster showed Jim Henson and Kermit the Frog. In the corner of each poster was the Apple log and the two words think different. The other campaign was the brainchild of Steve Jobs. He wanted to show when, what Apple stood for, new ideas, not the same old. Same old, the poster didn't advertise any particular product. 
But they told the public to be ready because something exciting was happening at Apple. What was happening was the iMac, short for Internet Macintosh. This new personal computer was inexpensive and easy to use in the 1990s. There was a brand new pastime, surfing the web. Steve wanted people to surf on IMAX. He also wanted IMAX to look different. The iMac came in a plastic case in five bright colors inspired by Steve's visit to Jelly Bean Factory, Blueberry, Grape, Lime, Strawberry, and Tangerine. Within a year, the iMac became the best-selling computer in the world. That same year, Steve and Lauren had another baby daughter, Eve. Steve's eldest daughter, Lisa, was studying journalist at Harvard University. It was a happy time in Steve's life. Steve had planned to only stay at Apple for a few months, but in 2000, he became the permanent head. He had too many big plans to leave Apple now. In May 2001, Apple opened its first storage, just as Apple computers didn't like look like other computers. Apple stores were very different too, made with a lot of glass. They looked more like walks of earth. Steve oversaw every step of the design of the stores from the floor tiles to the shelves. Every single detail was important to him. At the store's genius bar, people could ask questions about the problems with their machines and get personal training on their computers. Steve had put Apple on top of the personal computer market. As he had predicted, people used their computers for work and also for pleasure. Listening to music was something else that people did for fun. In the 1990s, most people listened to music on compact disc. A CD was like a record album. People bought CDs by their favorite groups and played them on CD players. They were about the size of a butter plate and had better sound than a vinyl record album. But Steve started thinking about something even better. He bought a software program that allowed people to take their favorite songs from a CD and put them on the computer as a digital file. It was called an MP3 file. Once it was on the computer, you didn't need the CD anymore. Steve renamed the program iTunes. Using iTunes, a person could turn their computer into a personal jukebox. Other companies created MP3 players. These were portable machines that hooked up to speakers or headphones and played music files. No CD or cassette tape was needed. Steve Jobs decided that Apple had to make its own player. In October 2001, at a press event in California, Steve reached into his pocket. He pulled out a thin gadget that was smaller than a bar of Hershey's chocolate. We call it the iPod, he said. At first, the iPod only worked with Mac computers, but in 2002, Steve agreed to make it work with Microsoft's Windows machines. Now that the Windows user could also use the iPod, its sales skyrocketed. Customers loved the iPod. People in the music industry did not. Most people got the songs they played on their iPods off CDs. The CD didn't have to be theirs. For instance, they could get songs for free from a friend's CD. Songs could also be shared over the internet. Nobody in the music industry could figure out how to make people pay for music that they could get for free illegally. Nobody except Steve. If people could buy music easily and cheaply, 
he thought they wouldn't mind paying, because he could think different. Steve opened the IG Music Store in 2003. It was not a regular store, it wasn't in a building, it was a program you downloaded onto a computer using his famous powers of persuasion. He made a deal with many record companies to sell their songs on iTunes for 99 cents a piece. In the first day it was open, the iTunes store sold 275,000 signs. It was so easy to order signs. It didn't cost much. Everyone began buying music over the internet. Chapter 8 Insanely Great Apple was back on top and so was Steve. He was still the head of Pixar. He was also helping to raise Reed, Erin, and Eve. Lisa had graduated from Harvard. His wife, Lauren, had founded College Track, a charity that helps kids from poor families get into college. Steve had many plans for the future. Then something happened that he could not control. In 2003, the medical, a medical checkup revealed that he had cancer in his pancreas. His doctors as well as Rowling and many friends advised Steve to have surgery right away. But, as always, Steve wanted to think different. Steve tried to treat his cancer by changing his diet, but the cancer grew. So in July 2004, he agreed to have surgery to remove the tumor. He told people at Apple he expect to, expected to return to work in September. Steve did return to work, however. He didn't look well. He was losing weight and was pale. People worried that the cancer was growing again. He didn't, he didn't talk much about being sick, but in 2005, he gave a speech to the graduating class at Stanford University. He said that having cancer showed him that time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. These were words that Steve Jobs truly lived by. Perhaps he didn't have much time left. So, once again, Steve began thinking about how to change the way people use the technology. By 2005, cell phones were everywhere. Steve had a call phone, but he didn't like it. It didn't work well or look good. None of his friends seemed to like their cell phone either. Steve decided to make a phone that people could fall in love with. In 2007, at the show for new Apple products, Steve showed the audience the iPhone. The iPhone was much more than a cell phone. It was a powerful personal computer that fit in your pocket. The iPhone made every other phone look outdated. It had a touch screen instead of buttons. Email was on it. The internet was too. The iPhone could take photos and film action. Even though early iPhones, like early Macs, had flaws, people couldn't wait to get their hands on one. Steve loved running Apple, but at the beginning of 2009, he started taking time off. Steve didn't admit that his cancer had returned. Even so, everyone at Apple knew that knew, knew that was the reason for his absence. Steve also got in touch with Walter e, e, as, e, Isaacson, a writer. Isaacson wrote the biographies, biographies. Steve asked if Isaacson would write his biography. Steve was usually very private, yet he was offering a tell all about his personal life. It seemed like he knew he might not live much longer. In April of that year, he had a liver transplant, transplant, transplant. half asleep before his operation. Steve complained that the medical equipment was ugly and poorly designed. A few months later, he returned to work. Despite his health, 
he had a new surprise for the public. In 2010, Steve bought out the iPad. Apple's new tablet computer. It was smaller, thinner, and lighter than anything before it. Tablet computers had been around for 20 years, but once again, Steve made it new and different. The iPad was a portable computer with no wires. It was much larger, larger than the iPhone, so it was easy to read books on it, or browse the web, or watch movies and play games. Apple sold 300,000 iPads in one day. In 1997, Apple had nearly gone bankrupt. In August 2011, it became the most successful company in the world. That same month, Steve stepped down as CEO. He was no longer well enough to continue working. He stayed at home with Lauren and their children. Many of Steve's friends came to spend time with him, including Bill Gates. The two men talked about all the times. Steve said he thanked Lauren for keeping him semi-sane. Bell said his wife, Melinda, had done the same for him. According to C Steve's sister, Mona Simpson, a few hours before he died, Steve looked at his sister, Patty, then his children, and then Lauren. He said, oh, well, oh, well, oh, well. Those were the last words he spoke. It was October 5, 2011. All over the world, people mourned, mourned the news. Apple stores were covered in sticky notes, thanking Steve for all he did. People left beating apples on the ground in tribute. In California, young people placed candles in the shape of apples logo on the sidewalk. Everyone felt that Steve Jobs had changed the way they lived. He hadn't invented the computer or the mouse or the MP3 player but he took those things and made them part of everyone's daily life. He had done exactly what he set out to do. He had achieved his dreams. One of the first people to speak about his death was his old friend and competitor Bill Gates. He said, for those of us lucky enough to get to work with him, it's been an insanely great honor.